and welcome back to The Tale of Despero by Kate DiCamillo. When we left off last time, we left, we, uh, we we're going to pick up actually at chapter 32, which is on page 162, the last two chapters of this book of Miggery Sal. The candlelight on Mig's tray revealed Gregory limping toward her, a thip, the thick rope tied around his ankle, his hands outstretched. You, Gregory presumes, have brought food for the jailer. Gore, said Mig. She took a step backward. Give it here, said Gregory, and he took the tray from Mig and sat down on an overturned kettle that had rolled free from the tower. He balanced the tray on his knees and stared at the covered plate. Gregory assumes that today again there was no soup. Eh, said Mig. Soup, shouted Gregory. Illegal, shouted Mig back. Most foolish, muttered Gregory as he lifted the cover off his plate. Too foolish to be born, a world without soup. He picked up a dr drumstick and put the whole of it in his mouth and chewed and swallowed. Here, yeah, said Mig, staring at him. You forgot the bones. Not forgotten, chewed. Gore, said Mig, staring at Gregory with respect. You ate the bones? You are most ferocious. Gregory ate another piece of chicken, a wing, bones and all, and then another. Mig watched him admiringly. Some day, she said, moved suddenly to tell this man her deepest wish. I will be a princess. At this pronouncement, Chiara Roscuro, who was still at Mig's side, did a small, deliberate jig of joy. A jig is a dance. In the light of one, the one candle, his dancing shadow was large and fearsome indeed. Gregory sees you, he said, Gregory said to the rat's shadow. Roscuro ceased his dance. He moved to hide beneath Mig's skirts. Eh, shouted Mig. What's that? Nothing, said Gregory. So you aim to be a princess. Well, everyone has a foolish dream. Gregory, for instance, dreams of a world where soup is legal. And that rat, Gregory is sure, has some foolish dream too. If only you knew, whispered Roscuro. What? shouted Mig. Gregory said nothing more. Instead, he reached into his pocket and then held his napkin up to his face and sneezed into it once, achoo, twice, achoo, three times, achoo. Bless you, shouted Mig. Bless you, bless you. Back to the world of light, Gregory whispered. And then he balled the napkin up and placed it on the tray. Gregory is done, he said, and he held the tray out to Mig. Done, are you? One second, sorry. Done, are you? Then the tray goes back upstairs. Cook said it must. You take the tray to the deep downs. You wait for the old man to eat, and then you bring the tray back. Them's my instructions. Did they instruct you, too, to be a, beware of the rats? The what? The rats. What about them? Beware of them, shouted Gregory. Right, said Mig. Beware of the rats. Roscuro, hidden beneath Mig's skirts, rubbed his front paws together. Warn her all you like, old man, he whispered. My hour has arrived. The time is now and your rope must break. No nib, nib, nibbling this time. Rather a serious chew that will break it too. Mmm, yes, it is all coming clear. Revenge is at hand. Chapter 32. A Rat Who Knows Her Name. Mig had climbed to the dungeon stairs and was preparing to open the door to the kitchen when the rat spoke to her. May I detain you for a moment? Mig looked to the left and then to the right. Down here, said Roscuro. Mig looked at the floor. Gore, she said. But you're a rat, ain't you? And didn't the old man just warn me of such? Beware of the rats. Well, that's what he said. 
He held the tr she held the tray higher so that the light from the candle shone directly on Roscuro and the golden spoon on his head and the blood-red cloak around his neck. There's no need to panic, none at all, said Roscuro. As he talked, he reached behind his back and using the handle, he raised the soup spoon off of his head, much in the manner of the way a man lifts his hat to a lady. Gore, said, a, said Mig, a rat with manners. Yes, said Roscuro. How do you do? My papa had some cloth much like yours, Mr. Rat, said Mig. Red like that, but he traded it for me. Ah, said Roscuro, and he smiled a large knowing smile. Ah, did he really? That is a terrible story, a tragic story. Reader. If you will pardon me, we must pause for a moment to consider a great and unusual thing, a portentous thing. A great, unusual, portent portentous thing it is this. Roscuro's voice was pitched perfectly to make its way through the torturous path of Mig's broken down cauliflower ears. That is to say, dear reader, Miggery Sal heard, perfect and true, every single word the rat Roscuro uttered. You have had known your share of tragedy, said Roscuro to Mig. Perhaps it is time for you to make the acquaintance of triumph and glory. Triumph, said Mig. Glory? Allow me to introduce myself, said Roscuro. I am Chiara Roscuro. Friends call me Roscuro. And your name is Miggery Sal. And it is true, is it not, that most people call you simply Mig? Ain't that the thing, shouted Mig, a rat who knows me name. Miss Miggery, my dear, I do not want to appear too forward so early in our acquaintance, but may I inquire, am I right in ascertaining that you have aspirations? Guys, that's a fancy way of saying, I understand you have some pretty big goals. What do you mean, um, aspirations? shouted Mig. Miss Miggery, there is no need to shout, none at all, as you can hear me, so I can hear you. We two are perfectly suited, suited each to the other. Roscuro smiled again, displaying a mouthful of sharp yellow teeth. Aspirations, my dear, are those things that would make a serving girl wish to be a princess. Gore, agreed Mig. A princess is exactly what I want to be. There is, my dear, a way to make that happen. I believe that there is a way to make that dream come true. You mean that I could be the Princess P? Yes, your highness, said Roscuro, and he swept the spoon off of his head and bowed deeply at the waist. Yes, your most royal Princess P. Gore, said Mig. May I tell you my plan? May I illustrate for you how we can make your dream of becoming a princess a reality? Oh, yes, said Mig, yes. It begins, said Roscuro, with yours truly, me, chewing of a, the, and the chewing of a rope. Mig held the tray with the one small candle burning bright, and she listened as the rat went on speaking directly to the wish of her heart. So passionately did Roscuro speak and so intently did the serving girl listen that neither noticed that the napkin on the tray moved. Nor did they hear the small mouse-like noises of disbelief and outrage that issued from the napkin as Roscuro went on unfolding step by step his diabolical plan to bring the princess to darkness. That is the end of book three. Why might the napkin on the tray have moved? And why might there have been mouse-like noises of disbelief? Have we found an old friend? Perhaps. Stay tuned as we embark upon book four recalled to the light in our next segment. Thanks, you guys. See you soon.